Learning is said to be an enlightening experience, which is why we learn the most in our darkest moments. The question you need to answer for yourself is whether you are shaped by the light around you or the shadow left behind you. Perspective is important as you walk through life because oftentimes the people who make it to the top are the ones who either have an understanding of themselves or the world around them. Either way leads you to shape yourself for the journey that allows you to see a vision that only the greatest can see and grab the dream that is made available through a combination of factors that include fate and luck. The kind of people who have this understanding one way or another won't let the world distract them with false promises, beat them down with petty insults, or stop them from reaching their utmost potential. That's why Blackbeard and Jaya told Nami, it isn't easy to be great. Let them laugh. If you're aiming for the top, you don't always need your fist to show your might. This was said in support of how Luffy handled himself in the primary Bellamy confrontation. And this statement really shaped not just Blackbeard and his character, but also his perspective that ends up agreeing with Luffy, which further just justifies why these two opposite but paralleled characters are going to be the ones to clash at the top in a way that will wake up the world. But we really have to pull apart the differences to understand the gravity of this situation. So in this video, I'm going to connect you to how I see Blackbeard reaching the top and what that means specifically for his crew. So if you're new to the channel, the way I view the world is by making connections. So let me connect you to my vision, the Par vision. So while Blackbeard is a highlighted character in the series, he and his powers have been left largely in the dark for us. There's so many question marks that continue to pile up when it comes to Blackbeard, like why did Marco highlight his odd body as a response to Blackbeard being able to wield two devil fruits? He says Teach isn't a normal human, and that sentiment ties all the way back to the Odin flashback when we see Buggy and Shanks discussing a young Blackbeard in regards to the actions during the ceasefire in Roger and Whitebeard's battle. Buggy says Blackbeard didn't sleep for two nights and heard that he's never slept in his life, and because of that, Buggy regards him as a monster. Before we continue, I do want to note another significant line here about perspective. While Buggy sees this as a monstrous feat, Shanks looks at it with more of a Luffy type of perspective, where he thinks because Blackbeard doesn't sleep, he is a lucky guy, and he probably has had twice as much fun. We'll bring up that sentiment later on, but to summarize what we have to go off of right now, Blackbeard has an odd body and is a monster who never sleeps. And normally these kinds of things would bring an individual down and inhibit their path to the top, but we see Blackbeard making use of his odd body. Apparently he learned or somehow knew that his odd body could do the unthinkable, which is contain two devil fruits. Which, while this info is from Annie's lobby, we hear Bluno tell us that, according to Grand Line scholars, there's an example of someone who ate two fruits and his body fractured until there was nothing left of it. Now, we can make a soft assumption that the Grand Line scholar they probably were talking about was Vegapunk, considering he was referenced as being an expert on devil fruits at the end of this arc, and is corroborated by current day information, but also one of his inventions in Funkfried is wielded by CP9, which Kobe basically told us that Vegapunk is responsible for that. And and in current chapters, we see that Cypher Pole and Vegapunk do interact. And I highlight this because that would mean that Blackbeard would be considered an anomaly for even Vegapunk. It makes you wonder if Blackbeard and Kuma maybe are birds of a feather in that regard. But the thing is, however Blackbeard learned of his innate ability, he had to have done it on his own without involving scientific guidance and theoretical explanations, meaning he knew his body really well. He was orphaned, picked up by Whitebeard, and it doesn't seem like anyone else is dabbling in anything similar to what Blackbeard was. Now, one possibility that I will acknowledge for the sake of this video is something I brought up in my Shadow's theory in that it could very well be that the Yami Yami no Mi that he acquired is the primary reason as to why he is able to handle multiple fruits, which we'll bring up later. And speaking of awareness, that's probably Blackbeard's most powerful weapon. Fitting for a monster that never sleeps, he seems to be really taking advantage of being awake. If this rumor about Blackbeard is true, then that means Blackbeard is somehow functioning through some fictional explanation. But this does imply that Blackbeard, though 39 right now, has roughly the experience of 78 years behind him. The questionable knowledge that he has could simply be explained by the vast amount of time that he he is again somehow allowed to have, and has had ever since he was a child, which can be reflected in his foresight. According to him, he joined Whitebeard's ship because he knew it was his best chance of finding the devil fruit that he searched for his entire life, and on top of that, the way he knew about it was because he memorized all the shapes of the devil fruits in the identification manual. As a 12-year-old orphan, Blackbeard was knowledgeable about pirates and devil fruits, and this latter detail could make him basically a specialized botanist, which is an interesting point because Oda in SBS 88 said that if Blackbeard wasn't a pirate, he'd be an archaeologist. But also in SBS 82, he says Blackbeard's hobbies are gambling and historical research. And considering Blackbeard at the age of 12 memorized all of the devil fruits, or at the minimum, the yami yami, then I wonder how much more research Marshall did besides all of that. Obviously exaggerating for when Blackbeard gets out of his top 
toddler years and downloads of consciousness, but you could technically double those years and say that he had at least 20 years of time researching prior to meeting Whitebeard. And what you could say is from that point on, Blackbeard has been gambling with the world, constantly risking himself and learning from the results. Which we know that Teach had no intentions to really rise in the ranks of Whitebeard's crew. Even Ace at one point wondered why Blackbeard didn't want the second commander position, and Blackbeard said he doesn't have those kinds of ambitions. Which we recently started to get more concrete details about, but it all started once Blackbeard's first gamble paid off. He chose to join Whitebeard's crew over anyone else, but here's the interesting part. Blackbeard claims that his devil fruit chose him. After learning about Luffy's devil fruit and what the Gorosei say about how devil fruits have wills and that they surmise that Luffy's devil fruit was evading them, it might be accurate to say that the darkness fruit found Blackbeard, but I wonder why it didn't end up directly in his hands. I sometimes wonder how much easier Blackbeard's life could have been if he got the Yami Yami without killing Thatch and thereafter staying within the Whitebeard Pirates. I might make that a what if video. But anyways, what if the Yami Yami no Mi purposely ended up in Thatch's hand to test Blackbeard's desire? The Yami Yami being the darkness that sucks in everything would be testing the depth of Blackbeard's treachery, a type of greed that knows no bound, willing to consume anything and everything necessary to achieve a goal. That's probably the primary component that the fruit seeked and ultimately found. And like Luffy awakening his devil fruit through several extreme circumstances that tested his resolve, Blackbeard probably already fulfilled the requirements for his Yami Yami no Mi, and so I wouldn't be surprised that if Blackbeard hasn't already awakened his devil fruit, he will soon. But right now for me, it makes more sense that he already awakened it due to his wisdom buff that he gets from never sleeping and embodying a sense of greed that liberates him from all attachments. But anyways, what we learn about how to awaken is being one with your power. As Kaido said, awakening is what happens when your mind and body catch up to your powers. As we mentioned before, Blackbeard seems to know the full extent of his body and mentally is well suited to his power, proving over and over again that he is a character that wherever he shows up is the character that takes what he wants and leaves behind a sort of nothingness. Whether it was Ace, Impel Down, Whitebeard, Baltigo, but it's not like Blackbeard has always won. And that actually might be an important viewpoint. Blackbeard is a smart gambler. He takes on risk and essentially experiments and pushes his boundaries. We see this especially in the recent Blackbeard moments. He is making strategic decisions and essentially safely testing himself, putting himself in situations where he might not have an overwhelming victory, but a valuable one nonetheless, which is kind of what we see out of Luffy as well, taking fights that are definitely not in his favor, but overcoming them through a different kind of means. I think Blackbeard and Luffy are two sides of the same coin, which is exactly how we were introduced to Marshall D. Teach. Even the way they probably reach their respective awakenings. So let's reflect really quickly about Luffy's path because we might actually learn a lot about Blackbeard by doing so. Again, something I want to emphasize, you can define your body by the darkness left behind you or by the light that embraces you. And in that regard, the way Luffy has progressed through his journey has been by becoming the guiding light. Luffy ends up challenging each world created on the various islands and ultimately bringing them a new dawn. In that endeavor, Luffy has reshaped himself, learning what freedom is and what it feels like, landing on his final form gear 5. We see him understanding how to push his body to the upper limits, how to make the biggest impact, how his body works under pressure, then transforms that pressure into ultimate forms and reaching the godly existence of Nika, the sun god, where he feels that he is at the peak of his powers being able to fight as freely as he wants. And while Luffy experienced those developments in tandem, he was also mentally reshaped. As a child, he was already on a path towards freedom wanting to become a pirate as opposed to a duty bound navy man. He learned that freedom comes at a cost and just because you live freely doesn't mean you should throw away your life for free. He suffered a pain that he will never forget in that he permanently damaged his hero because he stuck out his neck when it wasn't needed. He learned that when you raise your arms for a fight, it should be when you're willing to put your life on the line for something worth defending. We later see Luffy putting his life on the line to protect Ace and Sabo, but it wasn't to save their treasure. It was to maintain his friendship and promises. Luffy says being alone is worse than being physically hurt. So he understood what he would put his life on the line for, friends. And fortunately, his devil fruit allowed him to take on more pain than humanly possible. It allowed him to always be able to bounce back from any situation, especially for the sake of those that believed in him, shouldering their dignity, their pride, their freedom, their faith, and their burdens. He acts as the light that allows everyone who sees his smile to feel a sense of warmth and freedom that inspires them to also chase their dreams. So Luffy, in a way, is like 
their dawn that awakens people to the best versions of themselves, the ones that romantically chase their dreams. So as Luffy brings the new era, people put their hopes and dreams into Luffy, because without his light, they would get lost. When they hear the laugh or see the smile, they know to continue on. As long as people believe in Luffy, he will rise again. This is how the sun works. And while that is a beautiful occurrence, no one truly grasped the burden of the sun. Luffy's body was made to be the most liberating, but let's remember how. It's by absorbing damage, whether physically or mentally. It's the kind of power that if you're using it to the maximum potential, then you are bouncing back from life-ending blows with a smile on your face. That's not sustainable. Remember, freedom comes at a cost and Luffy has been paying for it with his life on the line. And we actually witnessed how a normal human endures the full brunt of pain that Luffy had undergone while debuting as the warrior of hope that liberated the shadowless folk in Thriller Bark with Zoro. Let's pick apart this scene briefly. Kuma came to Thriller Bark to take Luffy's head, and given Luffy was out of commission and could not defend himself, his right hand, Zoro, stepped up to the plate, shouldering the burden that was normally Luffy's in protecting the crew. And recognizing the perilous situation, Zoro had no choice but to concede to Kuma and offer a trade. His head for Luffy's. Now, I will be analyzing this scene in full in a future video, but I'm going to skip on some things for the sake of time. So what happens next is really interesting. Kuma says in order to properly take take Luffy's place, you need to first take on his anguish that he experienced during the course of Thriller Bark, which at first you're kind of like, what do you mean? It's typical Luffy. He beats the bad guy. Sure, it's difficult, but he never complains. To emphasize this, in the manga, once Moria is taken down, they actually don't show Luffy until Kuma threatens their lives. But we do get an acknowledgement from the people closest to the sun that they were concerned about Luffy. They thought maybe he was pushing himself too far and how future threats would be overwhelming. But how could they ever truly know and understand? Luffy never complains and in this instance he just fell asleep kind of like how he normally does with a peaceful look. But Kuma showed us that beneath that peace was a world of pain that only Zoro got to experience. And let's talk about the aftermath but recontextualize it with the new understanding in Kuma's power that we got from Vegapunk. It was that pain and memory were all signals emitted by neurons in the nervous system. Kuma's powers could transfer these signals to others as if it were a radio system. Which I want to point out is something that ties back to the elemental hockey theory and something Oda inserted way back with Anel and how he was able to amplify his foresight abilities by sensing the neuron signaling. But back to this scene, not only is Vegapunk tying pain to memories, but just after this flashback, we get Vegapunk saying Kuma's bubble is pain, whereas Bonnie, knowing the power, says it's just memories. And we get the fallout of this moment and see that it was indeed pain. It was painful memories. At the end of the day, the way pain is processed in the body is via neuron signaling. If those signals are shut down, then no pain is felt, which is an actual rare and dangerous condition, but we'll talk about that another day. If we go back to the Zoro situation now with this, it's not like Kuma beat Zoro up in the exact same way that Luffy was obliterated through the arc. The only way he could do it is by essentially giving Zoro a replay of the memories of what happened, the exact signaling that Luffy went through which is why we get the electric shock kind of effect that jolts Zoro to a realization about who his captain was and what this man was doing all this time. It's not like Zoro underestimated the burden, but no one can ever imagine the pain of someone who can be at death's door and still smile. The first thing Zoro does once he is able to move is exercise, realizing he is too weak and needs to get stronger for the crew. Keep in mind this is Zoro, one of the toughest individuals in all of One Piece, recognizing that his captain actually has been enduring so much on behalf of the crew but also the people around him. And something important to think about and I want to clarify that I'm not saying this moment wasn't Zoro's but maybe that nothing happened moment could partially be influenced by Luffy's memories. So maybe there's a valuable hint in Zoro saying nothing happened after suffering all this much because if Zoro is struggling to speak, then I'm not sure how Luffy manages anything after any of his fights. Now that Zoro has experienced what Luffy has gone through, he probably much better understands the resolve that Luffy has towards their journey, towards his dream. On the surface, Luffy is just a happy-go-lucky pirate that wants to be free, but like Luffy learned, freedom comes at a price, and Zoro got a taste of the cost that Luffy has been paying. This price is something that all of the Straw Hats realized deep down when they trained during the time skip. But Zoro was the one who went the extra mile beyond the rest, maybe except for Sanji, but that was a different kind of sacrifice that I've talked about before. But when it came to the Kuma situation, Zoro declared his ambitions and even Kuma said that his ambitions were so grand, yet he was willing to sacrifice it for Luffy. And thereafter, we see Zoro tripling down on that sentiment after experiencing Luffy's memories. He was willing to sacrifice his pride again by asking Mihawk, his mortal enemy 
enemy to train him, in hopes that his captain wouldn't have to pay the price of freedom alone in the future. And a sort of comical mention I want to make is that now that Luffy told his crew his dream in chapter 1060, this face that Zoro makes is all that funnier. He looks at Luffy bewildered with sweat dripping down his face, something I've dissected before in the Luffy's dream video. And now my synthesis would be that Zoro's thinking, he goes through all that pain for this? But anyways, to this day, Luffy had no idea as to why he recovered on Thriller Bark so quickly. He never found out that Zoro did this or that Brooks saw it, and that Sanji and Robin heard about Zoro's actions. That's important because they can probably realize the gravity of what Zoro underwent there. And even more so, Sanji tells these two random goobers that Luffy would beat himself up for causing his friends so much pain. That is the self-sacrificial nature of the sun. The sun itself is this nuclear ball of toxic radiation that cannot reasonably sustain life on itself. It's an existence that is meant to burn out eventually like all natural things, but as a result it brings entire worlds into its warmth, into its orbit. It reminds me of how Kobe described Luffy to Drake, in that when you're on Luffy's side he feels so close to you, but when he's an enemy he feels so out of reach. And Drake was confused and got even more confused when Kobe said Luffy has this power that pulls people in towards him, and as the sun in the lives of so many, he would have that kind of gravity, which that is what Mihawk said in addition to this in that Luffy has some quality that makes people want to help him. And that's where we transition back to Blackbeard, the other side of the coin. Darkness which also has its own infinite gravity. And to analogize this to Luffy who is the sun, Blackbeard is a black hole that is a darkness so dense it sucks in everything, even light. So in his own way, Blackbeard is the same as Luffy. And we see that sort of happen coming out of Impel Down. Blackbeard is more deliberate in his recruitment practices as he forced the tournament on half of his crew, but nonetheless, we see him naturally attract crewmates and the latter half of crewmates acclimate pretty well, all coming to a common denominator of leaving their fate up to destiny, or that their paths were already decided by fate. We even see Blackbeard's more outlier recruits in Shiryu and Kuzan replaying a similar sentiment. Shiryu kind of just went with the flow and accepted what the future had in store for him, and with Kuzan, we see something a little bit more complex, but when he went to save Smoker, he says, then I guess it was fate that brought me here. To me, it seems like the people who gravitate towards Blackbeard were people who got lost in the light and had no choice but to turn around and focus on their shadows. There's two exceptions to that, but overall it seems like if you were to compare Blackbeard's crew and Luffy's crew, the ideological difference is the Straw Hats believe in free will, whereas Blackbeard's crew believes in a sort of predetermined fate. But it's not necessarily completely radical sentiments in that both sides do share some commonalities in belief. Luck is a big one, but also the crew's belief in their captain or rather the reliance on their captain to bring in the future they believe in. We see the Straw Hats unwavering belief in their son's ability to persevere through any adversity, but they don't want Luffy to do it alone, and they want to contribute as much as possible to that end. With Blackbeard, they all seem similarly drawn to him, even with Shiryu wondering whether if Blackbeard failed at Marineford if they were to disband afterwards. It's questionable if Blackbeard's crew would have had the same ability to maintain their orbit without Blackbeard serving as a central point. Despite that, Blackbeard says pirates simply need an alignment of interest to work together. We understood really well the motivations and reasoning for all of Luffy's allies to gravitate towards him, but what is Blackbeard's gravity? Do they have the same dream? Most likely not. Is Blackbeard helping each of them reach their dreams, or is Blackbeard an inspirational figure like Luffy? We can't really say. I mean, we have virtually no real goals out of any of the Blackbeard crew, and the main one we can look at more heavily is Shiryu and Kuzan. I think with Shiryu, what we can gather is that it looks like maybe Shiryu you simply sees the opportunity to be himself as much as possible. As a cold-blooded killer, he became a jailer that was allowed to do so within Impel Down, but they put a restriction on him and punished him for doing what he loved to do. All of Blackbeard's crewmates could be characters that were punished for being themselves, rejects of society, but also they weren't just any kind of rejects, they were the best rejects. Now I'm not saying I can say this for every single crewmate, but there is an umbrella where they all fit into and I think this this might be it. The world left them alone and as a result they only had themselves to focus on. And so they became more of what the world told them they were. Whether it was Da Q being sick, Burgess being strong, or San Juan Wolf being giant. Rather than focusing on what they could be, they were empowering what the world forged them into. And that is the difference between the light and dark. On Luffy's crew you could be a reindeer monster who aspires to be the world's greatest doctor. You could be an impressed fisherman who has only seen discrimination 
discrimination in his life, but see a world where that improbability of freedom is now a possibility. In the world of the light, it's not about who you used to be or even who you are right now. It's about what you see in front of you and if you are willing to grab it. You are able to be anything, anyone, and go anywhere as long as you will it hard enough. Whereas in the world of darkness, it's about what the world left you with and making the most of it. Because again, in order to see who they are, they turn from the light to see the shape of their shadow to define themselves. Why try to be anything else when all people do is judge you based off your dark past and not your bright future? But in a world where everyone closes their eyes in fear of the future, it's no wonder all they end up seeing is darkness. When the people in power whose responsibility it is to protect you end up turning a blind eye towards injustice, how can you have any hope for a brighter world? It's easy to get stuck in the dark because sometimes life hands you a few bad cards and a few spoiled apples. And Doc Q is probably the easiest person for me to explain this perspective. Sometimes people weren't born with the same luck as others, with the same sunshine as others. The unfairness of where the light lands can be damaging. Doc Q is a man that is chronically sick his entire life from childhood and looks at a world where everyone else is healthy. The unimaginable difference in opportunity that comes from simply being healthy can drag you into the world of darkness. It's easy to be put in a box finding yourself saying my illness or my disability defines me and that's all I can be. When in reality that's a limited view only looking at the reductive side of you. So while the presumption is that only people who chase their dreams are strong willed people, I don't think it's that straightforward because surviving and persevering in the darkness is not something a weak willed person could do. And so if you were to imagine that you were looking at your shadow and you wanted to be more than just what's between the lines made by that darkness, how would you do it? Wouldn't it be by taking away the light? The way you expand your shadow is by bringing everyone into darkness, into nothingness. And that's where Blackbeard comes in. I think Luffy is teaching everyone around him how to live in the light because most of them were so close to being people who stayed in the shadows. Blackbeard is going to or already has taught his crew how to live in the darkness. And I say already has because if it were about empowering what you already have, then Blackbeard has done that in the best way possible by fitting his crew with nearly perfect devil fruit matches with their already established personas. Doc Q, for example, being sick his whole life was given the sick sick fruit. Burgess being a world champion grappler gets the strong strong fruit. There's a giant that gets even more giant and a sniper in Van Auger gets one of the most desirable fruits for sniping in the warp warp fruit. If you go through the entire list of Blackbeard pirates, you'll find that almost all of them are extremely well matched their powers or personalities. Maybe just like Blackbeard found his fruit by fate, they all happen to find their own fruits. But we know they were hunting for fruits. This shows their desire to fall into the best future timeline despite fate. And remember what we said about awakenings? It's when your mind and body are one with the power. It seems like the Blackbeard pirates are one way or another already on their path towards awakening and that Blackbeard is aiming to awaken all of them. He wants them to fulfill their maximum potential just like Luffy wants of his crew. Both captains want to offer the dreams of their crews, but unfortunately while in the world of darkness, the best way to operate is to be self aware, and in some regards, to be selfish, leading to selfish dreams. While Luffy can say he wants to be king of the pirates to create a world where his friends can eat, Luffy can regard most people as his friends, whereas someone like Blackbeard could want the same exact thing but would have a much tighter definition of friendship, if he can possibly create that considering he was willing to throw away his family on three occasions and destroy it the fourth time. But anyways, bringing his crew to awakening sounds crazy, because from our perspective, most of these crewmates recently acquired their devil fruit powers. It's not even a two year time skip for some of them. It's likely Burgess got his strong strong fruit after Dressrosa. So how can Blackbeard get them to awaken in such a short amount of time and what will that look like? And for that as you can imagine this video is focused on Blackbeard and so I will offset the awakenings conversation to another video that should come out soon after this one. From a narrative perspective it just makes sense that the devil fruit heavy end stage pirate crew would access this power and I don't want to boggle down the depth of that video within the depths of the Blackbeard video, and you'll understand why at the end of this video. And before we continue on to how Blackbeard gets them to awaken, thank you for making it this far. If you've enjoyed listening, consider liking, subscribing, and sharing this video. Rep the visionary merch like so many others, and most of all, check out the other videos that are in the same series where I dive deep into characters' past and presents to better understand their futures. And speaking about futures, let's touch back on how Blackbeard can get his crew to awaken so quickly. Well, he already has a strong 
foundation in that he found the perfect base users for the respective devil fruits to maximize their potentials. We do see something interesting with San Juan Wolf. He is a shy giant that hides behind things when we are first introduced to him, but post time skip, we see him embracing his size, sleeping out in the open for everyone to see. So it might be that in order to awaken the giant fruit, it would be to be proud, which makes complete sense for the giant fruit because that's what giants are proud. And so again, I'll explain more of my thoughts there in a separate video, but overall, I think what's needed for awakenings in such a short amount of time is knowledge. I think Blackbeard is going to use one of his core competencies in his proficiency in studying history and memorizing it and use that to teach his crew. Isn't that ironic that Blackbeard's name is Marshall D. Teach? Blackbeard has the benefit of knowledge of probably double that of his age peers due to the fact that he never sleeps. He said he has memorized the devil fruit from the encyclopedia and seems to even be knowledgeable of the various abilities that should be possible like Law's Opi Opi no Mi. He was surprised but quick to realize that Law was using his fruits awakening in their fight on Winter's Island. And there's actually a deeper thing that Oda has had Blackbeard do nearly every single time he was in a fight except for one time. In each showing, he demonstrated his hobbies, gambling and historical research. And that might have confused you, but trust me and hear me out. In almost every showing, Blackbeard takes the first hit. I think there's a reason to it because he has demonstrated that he is capable of breaking this pattern with Boa. Against Boa, there was not a single scratch on him, and Boa is no slouch as a fighter. In terms of being able to land a hit, I would say that Boa might be one of the most competent fighters in the series. The fact that Blackbeard was able to avoid Boa tells me that he is probably more capable than he lets on, and that there's a reason he lets his opponents hit him first all the other times. It's because of pain. When Blackbeard described his powers in chapter 441, he says darkness sucks in everything, whether it's punches, blades, bullets, fire, or lightning. Unlike most Logias, he cannot go intangible and dodge the attacks because he says my body absorbs all pain, and that pain is amplified in the process. Do you remember the important thing about pain? It's that pain is memories. It's knowledge. I think in every fight, Blackbeard makes a gamble whether or not he can take a first hit so that he can learn about the power he is facing. He absorbs the pain and gains an understanding of that power. And what I'm also implying is that Blackbeard has insane observation hockey in that in order to make the gambles in his favor, he has to be able to know he can survive. It makes sense that Blackbeard's most proficient hockey type is his observation hockey, as I talked about in the Shanks video, but also because Blackbeard was the first character to demonstrate a core ability of observation hockey. That ability being being to judge power levels. He did this to Luffy and Impel Down and that's exactly what I think he is really good at being able to do with his observation hockey. Power scale. Yes, I'm saying Blackbeard is probably one of the best power scalers in the verse, but him having this self-awareness and knowledge of Boa's fruit is why he knew he could not gamble with her. But cycling back to the major point, I think Blackbeard actually told us he was training his own crew during the fight with Ace. He seemed very confident that his entire crew wasn't up to Ace's level. Blackbeard probably determined this on both sides using observation hockey, but also he said something after. Darkness can absorb punches, blades, and bullets. And while I'm sure Blackbeard had to experience this through normal pirate life, it feels very interesting to point all of those things out after he says he can absorb everything, and mentions crazier things like fire and lightning. So that might have been another way for Oda to hint that maybe he was interacting with his own crew and understanding their power levels, and thereafter teaching them how to improve by understanding the pain that they give him. And it's not just pain, he says it's amplified. So through some mechanism, if you were to say pain and memories are somewhat synonymous, as we discussed during the Vega Pankuma segment, then the memories are amplified as well. And so if you were to extrapolate that to when his crew got devil fruits, this exact method is probably how Blackbeard determined what the person's best match devil fruit was, but thereafter they probably used the devil fruits on Blackbeard, he absorbed the pain and thereafter understood the powers, and was able to convey a better understanding of each devil fruit. This this process could make Marshall D. Teach the best teacher. This process could be how Blackbeard managed to get his entire crew prepared to awaken, but also elevate and strengthen himself along the way by experiencing 
all of that amplified pain, that means every interaction is that much more meaningful to him and makes him much more durable in the future. Which explains why some would say that Blackbeard has top tier durability on top of everything else he has in store. And now we hit another parallel with Luffy, top tier durability, and the ability to absorb pain. I mean the line Blackbeard said about punches, blades, bullets, fire, and lightning can almost fully be applicable to Luffy. And so with that, I would imagine that once Zoro felt Luffy's pain, he was able to gain a much better understanding of Luffy's fruit, power levels, mentality, and so much more. And that experience that Zoro underwent on Thriller Bark is what Blackbeard experienced over and over again resolving himself. This devotion and process is what probably makes his crew so loyal to Blackbeard. Someone willing to understand you in this manner would create a huge connection in the same way we would say Zoro is the most loyal crewmate to Luffy. But there's one issue here. Zoro experienced Luffy's pain through Kuma's power. At the moment, we don't necessarily know if Blackbeard's power allows him to output this pain in a similar way. We do know that he is able to use a move called Liberation where he spits out all of the things that he has absorbed, but we haven't really seen him push out the fire that he absorbed from Ace, for example. He can absorb the pain, but can he share the pain? Sharing might not be something he innately has, and while he can teach as much as he can, giving his students first-hand experience would be the best way to teach. But that might explain the powers that he's hunted but hasn't stolen in Pudding and Moria. With Pudding, we have to remember that it's not her devil fruit that's valuable for Poneglyphs from what is said. It's her third eye which isn't awakened yet. And also her having a third eye that when awakened can read Poneglyphs might not be knowledge that even Blackbeard has. So it could be that the main reason Blackbeard wants Pudding is not necessarily for the Poneglyphs but rather to share his memories with his crew. And at the same time, what I said about awakenings, it could be that the awakening that Pudding has long awaited for is reached by her interactions with Blackbeard, and he helps her awaken as well as a way to get her to be more cooperative. And so the end result being that all Blackbeard's crew needs is snippets of Blackbeard's knowledge of their own powers delivered by Pudding. Viola, who can do much of the same thing, would be another great example of someone who could be valuable here. But then we also have Moria, and this conversation is much more nuanced than you might think. But if you haven't seen my Shadows Theory yet that came out right after Gear 5, I highly recommend that video because I provided a logic line of how important shadows were to the story of One Piece. I mean, I was just saying that people who live in the darkness focused on their shadows want to expand their shadows and in that arc, we find out about the shadow revolution ability, the ability to stretch a shadow and make the body change according to your darkness. So there are a lot of important connections as for why Moria's power is going to be useful for Blackbeard. But what I want to sit on is the ability to transfer shadows because by transferring a shadow into another body, you also transfer personality, battle knowledge, and memories to a certain extent, considering Moria had to wipe Luffy's shadow memories. But also acknowledge that the shadows of strong-willed individuals are more resistant and take more time to lose their memories. But even then, we saw Ors using all of Luffy's techniques. This ability was able to allow Luffy to become a competent swordsman, for example, by putting a swordsman's shadow in his body. And there's a multitude of reasons why this concept is incredibly important for maybe not even how I explained it or how my shadows theory explained it, but the fact that Morga is here does imply that his power is valuable to Blackbeard somehow. And so here is another connection. I thought it was weird that Blackbeard mentioned that he could absorb lightning. It's not like he faced an L, or maybe this could imply that he went to Raijin Island. Sure, maybe he could have fought someone with lightning, but I feel like that mention was to tie back to the whole electrical elements of the nervous system. That goes back to how Anel was able to read electric signals, and when Luffy turned off his brain, Anel wasn't able to properly read Luffy's moves. Just noting that this is something Oda has incorporated in the One Piece world, and then goes back to what Vegapunk was saying about how memories and pain are translated throughout the body through electrical signals. All of this might explain not just how Blackbeard is able to negate devil fruits, but also how devil fruits work. Which goes back to one of my original theories about the origins of devil fruits. But let's reread what Blackbeard says. He says, my body absorbs all pain, and that pain is amplified in the process. But 
In exchange for that, there's another thing I can absorb. Then says he can pull in the actual body of Devil Fruit users. And then we see Ace realize what's happening and it's that when Blackbeard touches a Devil Fruit user's body, that user is no longer able to use their powers. Now in the original Shadows Theory, I propose the idea that through darkness control, Blackbeard can lock down a person's shadow, which would also render them unable to transform or manipulate their Devil Fruit. I really like that explanation and while my new explanation is different, I think the original fits within the new one. If we read that back, Blackbeard says his body absorbs all pain, which is synonymous with memories based on this discussion, and in exchange for that, he is able to take away Devil Fruit powers. So it might be that the other reason why Blackbeard takes the first hit from his opponents is to gain the memories from the pain of the attack, and then after learning about the power, he can then temporarily take away the memory of the Devil Fruit within the body of the user, and we see that every time. Blackbeard experiences the power, gets the pain of it and thereafter he basically instantly stops the user from being able to activate their power and in the law situation it was off screen when Blackbeard was about to use this power and we know how potent this is in that when Blackbeard used this on Luffy for the first time in the series since chapter one Luffy was no longer a rubber man he lost his rubber properties and both of my theories explain how this could happen but again I'm highlighting this to explain that this isn't even something that the sea can take away from Luffy this isn't something that Luffy necessarily activates, but nonetheless, Blackbeard prevents it. If his body forgot how to be rubber, then this could be the answer, which sounds crazy, but Blackbeard told us that he can absorb lightning, which would mean that if he knew how memories worked, then he could suck in the memories while touching the user. And so to explain that a little bit, if a Devil Fruit user is able to use their powers through some kind of imparted memories, then that could explain why when Big Mom got amnesia, she never used her Devil Fruit power a single time. But also, a good example to note is when Brook ate his fruit, he didn't know what the power necessarily was, but nonetheless, unconsciously, when his power was needed, it activated, allowing Brook's separated soul to revive his physical body, but also giving Brook the ability to control his soul. And that actually brings me to the next extension of this realization about Blackbeard. I surmise that this would be the case, but chapter 1073 came around to tell me that I mind roped with Oda correctly, and he was going to go this route, with the chapter called The Weight of Memory. Yes, in that chapter, Vegabunk tells us that people lose 21 grams of weight after they die. In other words, that is the weight of the human soul. The soul really exists. And it's ironic because by the time we get this flashback, we already know that the soul exists. I mean, we just talked about Brook's disconnected soul that has a form and a shape. Then we have Big Mom's soul soul devil fruit that takes people's souls and we see its shape and essence. And we see Vegapunk continue about how Kuma can foist off pain like a radio signal and wonders about the mind, memories, and mental images and says those things are also signals emitted by neurons. And we know after Kuma was capable of this, Zoro was able to experience Luffy's sufferings and Bonnie right now is experiencing Kuma's painful memories and it's sent like a radio signal. And that's where we have three things all connect. Not only do we know that the soul exists through this dialogue and Brooke, but that when someone dies, their soul does leave their body as shown by Brooke. So that is a part of the 21 grams for sure. Brooke retains his memories during this form of life. But you know what else he retains? his shadow. We learn that once someone dies, their shadow also leaves their body. We also know that without a shadow, the original master body cannot exist, and when Brook reincarnates, his shadow is also restored. So simply through Brook, we learn that the 21 grams, most likely if I had to make a soft assumption, is that the soul is probably 11 grams and the shadow is 10 grams. But I am curious because Vegapunk had this knowledge from a West Blue scholar, and I wonder if that test subject had a devil fruit, because when Brook dies, he maintains his devil fruit powers, which means that somehow in this spiritual form, he has the devil fruit within this form. That would mean that the devil fruit that he ate is transferred to this astral form. And we can say this because Brook is able to use the ability after death. But also there's more to it than just that. There's literally nothing physical on Brook's body that can house a devil fruit. There's no heart, no blood, no brains, just bones and hair. So that would mean that the devil fruit gets tied to a soul, but also transfers 
out like a soul. But let's step out of the brook example because even outside of that, we see the devil fruit transfer cycle where after death, it leaves the body. And so it could be that a devil fruit adds more weight to that initial 21 grams. But regardless, while this random person tells us this information, it is corroborated in that we literally see the cycle happen where Caesar's pet Smiley that carries the axolotl fruit dies when it's converted into Shinokuni gas. The fruit at a distance is then converted into a devil fruit and it's a pretty instant process, which makes sense that the fruit is able to receive something at a distance. If Vegapunk was in fact the scholar who Bluno referenced when saying they figured out how powers were conveyed, then it would explain how Caesar knew about the reincarnation process, also how to feed an inanimate object like slime a devil fruit like Funkfried, but more importantly how to control where the reincarnation happens. We still don't have the detail about how the devil fruit transfers into a fruit, whether it's the nearest fruit or it has to be the same fruit. What we do know is that for Caesar to recycle the axolotl fruit, he placed three apples nearby and one of them turned into the devil fruit. It would be weirder if Caesar did that without knowing how devil fruits reincarnated. He obviously wouldn't want to lose such a valuable fruit. So I think it's a safe assumption that this method Caesar used is actually guaranteeing the reincarnation. And I think it might be that in the One Piece world, fruits are receptive to radio signals. And it might even be that apples are the most receptive as we see Caesar use apples here, but also he uses them for his smile fruits. And most importantly, we see that in order to connect to punk records, instead of a normal antenna, Vegapunk uses an apple stem to receive the connection. So we get an example in the story of a centralized memory source that is transferring memories to a fruit through a controlled means outside of devil fruits. And wouldn't it make sense that Vegapunk would use the most receptive tool to facilitate this? And that's why he used an apple. I have more to say on that, but so all of this was to explain that devil fruits contain memories that are transferred and facilitated through an unknown means, but largely based in electrical signaling. And if you're a viewer of my channel, then you know the moon is what I think is facilitating the transfer, but I'll save that for the part two of the Void Century Records video. But returning back to Blackbeard, the focus of this video, we might have the full answer about how he was able to take Whitebeard's Gura Gura no Mi. When Whitebeard died, the 21 grams of memory left Whitebeard's body, Blackbeard pulled that in, understanding that these signals leave the body through electrical signaling. Blackbeard absorbed the isolated memories, and if Blackbeard acquired the memories of how to use the Devil Fruit as well as the Devil Fruit power itself, that would explain how he was able to use it so proficiently. The power that he says is coursing through him could be the new electrical signaling that he acquired. With this explanation, it could be possible that Blackbeard has Whitebeard's soul and shadow within his black hole and could simply be waiting for a moment to confer that to another vessel, maybe through Moria. But that's more of a stretch. There are some assumptions during Marineford that we can now debunk though. I think Blackbeard prevented the reincarnation of the Devil Fruit, but that doesn't necessarily need to happen as we know Vegapunk has made it possible to have two of the same powers coexist. If the powers were simply memories, then it wouldn't be absurd to think that they can be copied. What's interesting is Blackbeard says that he can turn all classes of Devil Fruits into nothingness essentially. Yet Vegapunk Vegapunk explains a divergence when it comes to each class. For Zoans, the fruit seems to be needed. Maybe that's because it also houses a will. For Paramecias, he can settle with green blood, which probably is just the memory stored in the lineage factors or DNA. And maybe Logias also contain a voice or a sound, which is why Vegapunk can't copy it. But I think Blackbeard specifically just took the entire memory of the devil fruit rather than just copying it or extracting it, meaning Blackbeard is preventing the fruit power from reincarnating. And another important important note here is that Blackbeard has nearly three decades of experience witnessing the fruit capable of destroying the world, being wielded by one of the strongest men on the planet. He was able to see firsthand how a proficient user uses the power, and we know he has a great visual memory. On top of that, probably top tier observation hockey that would allow him to be able to jumpstart his own proficiency as we saw him immediately recreate Whitebeard's strongest attacks. But beyond that, he also took a hit to the face and experienced the pain. Even even further elevating his understanding of this fruit from all sides. So if his mind already is acclimated to the power, all that's left is his body to match the power as well, in order for him to awaken. And if Blackbeard's already incredibly durable and is capable of withstanding two devil fruits without imploding, then that could explain all the reasons why Blackbeard has awakened, not only the Yami Yami, but also the Gura Gura. Or maybe Blackbeard has to do one more thing before awakening his second fruit, but if all that weren't enough to be terrified 
terrifying, he will be surrounded by a crew that masters their Devil Fruit Awakening, mirroring Luffy and the Straw Hat crew in a lot of ways, a central celestial body of sorts that has crewmates orbiting around like planets in our solar system, each of them providing the direction in order for those planets to be as developed as possible. But there's a huge difference. The sun exists to give. It outputs so much energy that it warms the orbiting planets and even sustains life on some of them. In return, we give virtually nothing back to the sun. Luffy never asks for compensation either. That's the generosity of the sun. And as a polar opposite, we have a black hole. And by now you already know what that means. It's greedy. It exists to swallow everything in its path, even light. There is no nurturing that we know of. And what I think Oda is portraying is something that has the gravity to attract. But Blackbeard's gravity isn't meant to give. It's to take. It takes everything all for itself. Do you understand the irony of what I'm saying? What did I say earlier? Blackbeard is going to teach his crew how to awaken their fruits and what, they're just going to be a merry band of pirates? Blackbeard said it himself, they just have an alignment of interests. But what are Blackbeard's interests? What does he dream of? He recently said he wants to turn Pirate Island into its own world government affiliated country and he would be the king of Blackbeard Kingdom. But at the same time is chasing the Poneglyphs. To be doing both implies that he has greater plans. You can't be a part of the world government while researching taboos. He should know that. This is a man who started with nothing, joined one of the world's greatest crews just to get a devil fruit. He had the opportunity to be a commander, but said he had no ambition for it. As a result of his nearly 26 years on the Whitebeard crew, he was invisible apparently. The world government did not recognize him as he had a bounty of zero. He murdered Thatch, one of his pirate brothers, and betrayed his family committing fratricide. So the time and camaraderie means nothing to him. He was willing to throw it all away for his own gain. I mean to you, does it seem like he cares for his crew? We don't know how the original five met, but the last six came together by chance. Kuzan and Shiryu just kind of showed up and then Devon, San Juan, Vasco, and Pizarro were just winners of the Impel Down level 6 deathmatch. When he showed up at Amazon Lily, he demonstrated the reluctant acceptance to kill Boa and lose his crewmates as a result, simply to ensure his own safety. Everything is about Blackbeard. Everything is for Blackbeard. As a contrast, Luffy disregarded his own safety multiple times against Boa to protect random strangers who had a lot of meat. And so while Blackbeard's crew is loyal to him, I'm very doubtful that he is loyal to anyone else but himself. And that makes sense because do you know what happens if you're caught in the gravity of a black hole? You get torn apart and ultimately fed into the black hole. It's inescapable and his crew is in that gravity. They chose the darkness. So with all of that, I wonder if you know what I'm getting at here. Here's another clue. Did you know what Oda originally named Blackbeard? Well, for one, his real name is Marshall D. Teach, but his concept name was Everything D. Teach. It was thought that everything was referring to Henry Avery, the man given the epithet as the pirate king in the real world. Most of the accolades attributed to Roger are what this man accomplished. He was never caught or killed and his treasure was never found. But the reason why the name everything stands out to me is because of how Blackbeard described his power. Darkness is gravity. A darkness so dense it sucks in everything. The power to turn everything into nothingness. And most importantly, he says no one escapes the gravity of darkness. I think given what we discussed about how he took Whitebeard's devil fruit and it being related to memory and pain, it might be that Blackbeard will get his crew to the highest level, cultivate them to the state of awakening, fattening them up, all for the express purpose of consuming them once they are the brightest lights they can be. If devil fruits are the dreams of someone else, then it might be accurate to say Blackbeard is going to become the dream eater. He is going to allow his crew to dream until the time comes for him to absorb their power and effectively gain the power of his entire crew. Remember how Luffy's crew carries their own dreams and Luffy helps inspire people to chase those dreams and as a result his crew wants to help shoulder the burden of Luffy's endeavors to lighten his load? Well at the same time Luffy recognizes that he cannot do everything and he trusts his crew to do all of the things he is incapable of. He doesn't doubt them and they never doubt 
him. Blackbeard will be the flip side of that. He will build up and use everything and everyone around him. He knows his limitations and so even if he could directly eat multiple devil fruits, he couldn't possibly bring them all to the awakened state like the other individuals could, mainly because it's not his dreams, it's theirs. Some of the awakenings might not even be known to him like Laws was, so he might be waiting for all of his crew to awaken so that he can receive the highest evolution of that dream's power. He is basically farming them and their affinity with various dreams. He will harness the power to destroy the world, host a world as an island man, protect it as a giant strong man, with the ability to change into anyone, warp wherever he wants, and the drinking fruit seems like a cherry on top, but adding on with invisibility and possibly even ice, all brought together by the darkness of his fruit. And who knows what will happen if all the fruits are awakened on top of that, and it might be that his goal is to continue and absorb fruits, his goal being to accumulate them all. If a black hole is hungry for energy, then dreams being electrical signals could make it be that it's the dynamic energy source that Vegapunk talks about, which would mean that's the greatest meal for Blackbeard. Everything will be his at the end of his vision, and there will be no exceptions. The kind of monster Blackbeard will be with this much power is why it was said to be the most dangerous power in the history of all Devil Fruit powers. These developments could make Blackbeard one of the most sinister villains in maybe all of fiction. This power would make Blackbeard next to unstoppable even without him having hockey. But you add everything he already has on top of that, and Blackbeard could become apocalyptic level powerful, creating a world not even dreams can live to tell the tales. So finally, I will say that I think at the core, Blackbeard's powers might be rooted in memories, or that the most valuable part of his darkness powers are if he is able to interact with memories and pain. Blackbeard ends up mirroring Luffy in almost every single conceivable way. The ability to tolerate the pain of others and shoulder their dreams, the gravity that draws people in, and their dedication to make it to the top. But the largest difference between the two is actually their perspective on dreams. See, Blackbeard's most powerful line contradicts with what Luffy said about dreams. Blackbeard said people's dreams never end. But in chapter 1060, Luffy tells us that his dream does in fact have an end. Is Luffy acknowledging his temporary existence there? which fits our son's role in our lives, the self-sacrificing celestial that allows us to dream, whereas Blackbeard would fit a completely opposite role? It might be that Blackbeard also wants to create a world that allows people to dream, but for the sole purpose to consume them. When you think about what his role was after Marineford, it was consuming Whitebeard's territory and destroying his crew along the way. But what happened to the Devil Fruit users in the crew? Because Jinbei tells us that Blackbeard possesses the means to kill power users and loot them of their ability abilities, and are in search of more powerful Devil Fruit powers. If we think about what Devil Fruits mean to us after what Vegapunk told us, he says all things are brought into this world with hope. Yes, even the Devil Fruits. Every Devil Fruit is a possibility for human evolution that someone desired. Those with powers exist in different dimensions dreamed up by someone else before them. So by Blackbeard hunting them, that would imply that he is hunting dreams. Not just any dreams, powerful dreams. Which is why we see a moment where Blackbeard says he hopes Luffy makes it to Sky Island and supports his dreams, and why he told Kobe not to trample on a man's dreams. It's because the more people dream, the more energy he can consume. Without dreams, the darkness he possesses will starve. So it might be that Blackbeard's end goal is to bring about a world of dreams, because Blackbeard's dream is to be able to experience dreams endlessly, which makes sense for a man that never sleeps and therefore cannot dream on his own. Which that might also be the connection that makes sense for why the Darkness Root would choose everything D teach. It's kind of weird in this context, but it might be that Blackbeard wants a world where people can sleep, maybe with one eye open, but nonetheless live in an overall peaceful world where dreams are rampant. He says that Pirate Island is a peaceful place, but also the Blackbeard Pirate's introduction was exactly this. To this day, we don't have many answers for the mystery of why the original five Blackbeard Pirates were on Drum Island. They apparently ransacked it, but of what? There were three Devil Fruit users, Dalton, Chopper, and Wapple, but Wapple was allowed to escape and the other two weren't all that affected. If he was looking for the human fruit, I'm sure he'd be able to find the island's famous monster reindeer boy. So if it wasn't devil fruits, maybe there was something else. So the other notable thing was that Blackbeard's arrival ended Wapple's evil reign. So now he had a kingless country at his feet that was already part of the world government and he just left it. Which given the recent chapters, if Blackbeard truly dreamed of this, then I don't think he would have let this opportunity slide. What's even 
even more interesting is that the citizens, while fearful of pirates, were more afraid of their old king returning and ended up seeing Blackbeard's arrival as a blessing because it allowed them to hope again. The monarchy is what they feared the most and what was preventing them from building a new peaceful nation. So what Blackbeard really looted this country of was an oppressive government. He forced the king to become a pirate and the citizens to defend themselves. And when you look at what Blackbeard actually does while holding all the power, he always gives individuals a choice. An impel down with the prisoners, with Bonnie, with Ace, with Moria, there's an interesting pattern. Blackbeard gives all of these people a choice while it may not be favorable. What follows after is the lack of choice provided by the world government. Moria was hunted down with no warning, same with Boa. Ace and the impel down prisoners were resigned to their verdicts, and we aren't sure of Bonnie's circumstance. And going back to Drum Kingdom, the king was a world government affiliated king. In other words, fear that was given authority supported by the world government. And look what happens naturally when the heritage based government leaves its castle. The smartest person takes residence there and ends up trying to help the entire nation. So it might be that Blackbeard intends to remove the unnatural government for a world that can more fairly fight for their dreams, also making for more powerful dreams to exist. I am super excited to see what Oda has in store for Blackbeard's character. Though we haven't gotten a lot, we will definitely be getting so many exciting developments from him. As I mentioned before, a video coming up very soon revolves around what the awakenings for his crew will look like and why they are meaningful, with possible predictions of who they end up fighting. Everything I said in this video doesn't necessarily have a tight timeline. It's honestly something that could start to be revealed now or revealed much later towards the end of the story. I think regardless, Oda has been building up a monster in the shadows of the story. Behind every bright and shiny event is the entity that has found itself behind every major movement. I've talked about why this is so wild for Shanks and his origin story, so check out that video, and I'll be talking more Blackbeard very soon. Something to remember until then, darkness is the absence of light, but without any light, what good is that darkness? If both of them want to inspire hope, but the world puts all of their hope into Luffy, and Blackbeard wants to consume all of that hope, who will end up over powering the other in the end. Will there be a balance that is struck? All I know right now is the end stages of One Piece will be on a magnitude beyond our imagination. So before I end, I want to add one other detail that I found interesting, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions about the memory element I proposed here, and I want to say I think memories are going to be important for the end of the One Piece story. The memories of the Going Merry brought us to tears, and we are in fear of what's in store for Kuma's memories, and the memories within the Poneglyph and at Laugh Tale had Roger laughing. And so all of these memories will tie and make us emotional. I will have a video talking about memory specifically, and so definitely leave me some questions to think about because from Sugar, Viola, Pudding, Kuma, Vegapunk, and even Moria, there's an interesting connection for their powers and memories, and I want to connect it all together. But before then, thank you for watching and listening. I hope this video inspired some new ideas and excitement for these characters and the future of the story. If you enjoyed, consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notification bell, sharing this video and my thoughts, and most importantly, thank you for connecting with my vision. And so the last detail that I think might be significant is that Blackbeard's backstory or his childhood might also end up mirroring Luffy perfectly. Or maybe not perfectly, but we do know that stars and black holes share a similar origin as well. And so what we know is that Luffy is willing to endure pain because loneliness is a much more painful experience. Oda told us that Blackbeard's childhood was also painful and lonely. So if they had the same beginnings, then what could have made them turn out so differently? They both seem to be able to wield a power that requires them to absorb an immense amount of pain. But what makes them so tolerant of it? Luffy ended up with Ace and Sabo, but there was a moment when he had a choice. He could have chosen his own safety over his friendship with them. Even Ace said Luffy should have given them up. And so what if that's the choice Blackbeard made? He chose himself and lost his friends or that they were killed. And it might be that in his loneliness and pain, it might be that this is how he developed his powerful memory. It was out of trauma to recreate them in his mind so that they were never forgotten and so their dreams never end. And so like Luffy who wanted to get stronger so he could protect everyone, Blackbeard might be the same way except the best way to protect all of the dreams is by him taking them himself. Marshall D. Teach, the man shaped by the darkness of everything. And so like always, thank you for connecting with me and I'm looking forward to connecting with you all on the next part vision. <laughs>